There are things that you go through because you are a black person that then is coupled with the fact that you're adopted by a white family. So those are two different layers that you have to navigate and it's when there's an interracial adoption because there's what people see when they look at you like and they expect you to be a specific way but then they don't know that oh hey this person's being adopted by people who are of a different culture people who are of a different race to them What is the pain in me that you wish you could heal? Do you remember being told you were adopted or was it a known part of the story from the get-go? <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was 110% a known part because it's like, it uh, looks like my parents have a melanin deficiency and then there's me, so no, it was definitely known from the start. You can't really hide that. Very, like, it's not easy to hide. It, with my family, I've got two white parents, so it's not like it's ambiguous. I came from Australia to be here for when the baby arrived. I knew there was one coming, but I didn't. We didn't know when she, you would arrive, so I came early and we waited. So I mean, we've been setting up the house and getting the, pra the prams and the cots and everything that, that was sort of in place, knowing that something was going to happen sooner or later. So, um, and we had to go through a lot of processes to get um, to adopt Handy through psychological evaluations and financial checking our finances and. And then one day, um, John said, "We have to go up to um, Joburg. Mm. We've got an appointment regarding the baby." So anyway, we went down the stage to Johannesburg, which is about three and a half hours away from our home. Did some shopping and then <laughs> mum and dad were going to have their appointment about the baby that they wanted. Mm. And I said, well, I'm not coming. I'll stay here in the hotel and read my book and you can pick me up when you finish. And went to have the meeting with our um, social worker. And she was telling us about this child that was ready for adoption and we were going, oh yeah, that's lovely, wonderful, okay, that sounds fabulous. And then she said, well, are you ready to go and get her? And we're like, what do you mean? <laughs> now! And she said, yeah, yeah, now, we're going now. And I thought that'd be about an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, no. Mm. The hours went by and it was about four hours or something. Yep. It was a long time. I was hungry. <laughs> 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 they didn't come. So uh, my husband and I had to run down to Woolies and get buy some nappies and some clothes and some, you know, blankets and things. We had no idea because um, we didn't. We really weren't expecting to be getting a baby at that moment. <laughs> so um, and we went to the hospital and they took us into the ward where Tandy was and other babies were there and um, showed us who she was and. Um, picked her up and, and held her for a while and all I can remember from there is, I'm not sure what happened next, but then we, we drove back to um, pick up my mother where she was staying. John came rushing in the door, mm. came over to where I was sitting and grabbed my suitcase and said, come. <laughs> and I followed John out the door and over towards your car. And when we got near the car, there's your mother standing there with a the bundle in her arm. And I said to myself, huh, she's trying to trick me. I know better than that. Anyway, she looked up from, she had been looking down, and she looked up, and the face on her, amazement, love, um, oh, so many, so many expressions on her face at the same time. And I thought, oh, 
goodness gracious, the baby is there. Then we had to drive all the way back to Petersburg with her. It's not called Petersburg anymore. Palakwani. Yeah, we go. And um, I remember I'd never forgiven my husband. Yeah. <laughs> he insisted on holding her the whole way home. <laughs> and I had to drive. <laughs> oh, shame, that's so yeah. rude. What? What are we doing? What are we doing? Hello. Who's that? Who's that? Who's that nice picture? Who's that? You're being filmed, darling. Dalinka, Dalinka. The minute you will come to learn means you won't see him until late tonight. But that's okay, because we can get up to plenty of mischief while he's gone. Okay? You've got that. It's the first lesson in life. Dada says I'm going just for a few minutes. That's right. That's when we can rub our hands together in glee and say, okay, we've got the whole day together. Not flesh of my flesh, nor bone of my bone, but still miraculously my own. Never forget, not for even a minute, that you didn't grow under my heart. But in it. Well, that's beautiful. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> you gave that to me. Yeah. I stuck it in my journal even. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> it really describes how I feel about you. Yeah. Yeah, you were always in my heart. <laughs> Initially, after I married John, I, I thought I didn't actually want to have children. So I was fine, that's where I was going along. And then we came to live in South Africa. And um, as time went on, I, I kind of changed my mind, thought actually it'd be really nice to have a family. John already had two grown children from his previous marriage, so he wasn't necessarily in any hurry to have any more kids. Um, so when I decided that I would really like to have a family, um, having been in South Africa, knowing that there were lots of kids that were um, needing to be adopted, uh, to me it was just like I'd rather adopt a child than bring another child into the world. I don't have to, I don't have to actually give birth to a child for it to be mine. Do you want to, there's a a letter here or a, a little couple of paragraphs that I wrote um, about waiting for Tandy and mm -hmm. some that John wrote as well. Mm. I'll, I'll read that one. It's called The Big Event. <laughs> in the days and months leading up to your arrival, I found myself in an increasing state of terror. <laughs> Can I do this? Will I be a good mother? What am I getting myself into? Happily, all my doubts and fears dissolved in an instant. The first time I saw your little face and held you in my arms, what an amazing, overwhelming, joyful and scary day. A little human being totally dependent on me. Wow. Life has never been the same since. Every moment of the experience of motherhood has brought joy and happiness into my life. Of a magnitude I could not have thought possible. Adopting you was the best decision of my life. Love you always, Mum. You forgot to do the kangaroo vid. I did. No, you didn't. I'm the kangaroo. You forgot to jump like a kangaroo. Go back. Oh, this way. the way. On that way. And all four days. I do consider myself lucky. Um, not, not just in the fact that I was adopted by lovely people, but because my birth mother was strong enough to give her child up for adoption. I can't even imagine what that's like. My, like she, she was like, okay, I am making the choice to give up, or maybe, I don't know if she made the choice herself or not, but she gave up a child for adoption. That must have, that must have taken so much strength. I can't even imagine. That's possibly one of the kindest things that she could ever, ever have done for me. I've, uh, Dad and I have, have offered to you mm. or asked you quite a few times whether you'd like to um, try and find your birth mother. Mm. Why did you decide not that you didn't want to do that at this stage? As a kid, I was sort of confused about my identity quite a bit. 
so as a kid I was a little bit confused about my identity because it was a whole um, okay I look different to my parents that let me go find who I look similar to somebody was willing to give me up for adoption to give me a better life and then I sort of thought maybe that was something painful that she could have gone through something painful and I, I might not necessarily be a good thing in her life. As I, I grew older, I figured out that, that, that there isn't something missing from me. And I think that was what I wanted to look for her. The reason that I did want to look for her was to find if, that missing piece. Have you ever spoken to your mom about your feelings regarding your issues of abandonment? I don't know. Have I? No, I don't think so. Not really. No. Tell her about it. So, like, um, basically for me, because, like, the first thing that happened to me that I was I was abandoned by someone. Mm. So that did have a lot of impact. That had a lot of impact on me when mm. it came to like fitting into a family, right? But there was also always that when I was younger there was the idea that I was brought in from the outside. And then that then it takes a while, it took a while from, for me to realize that I was wanted in general. It's just that I was wanted by different people. I think it's, it's, um, it's hard because then at the begin then at the beginning was sort of, I went through the stage of, okay, maybe I'm not enough. Maybe I am not. I wasn't enough for my birth mother, so then I was just passed along. But then you figure out, well, then I, I learned that I was enough because I know that I'm enough for my parents. But initially at the beginning, there was definitely that feeling of, of being an extra to somebody, of being a, a hassle. So then that was something that I had to get over. Had to get over the feeling of being unwanted. And I was lucky enough to have parents who do, who managed to make me feel wanted and loved. So. Oh, you're right. Oh, oh, oh no. that's I, a nice one. That is cute. Oh. That is cute. <laughs> I weird. like this one. And that one. Yeah, that's at the Kruger Park. Is it? Yeah. You have challenged me many times, and I think that that's good. Mm. Um, because you're using me as a sounding board, and uh, the reverse is true as well. Mm. I do the same with you. Mm. Mm. And then in that way, you have a symbiotic relationship. Yeah. Meaning that both gain from it. Mm. Okay. And that's the ultimate of any relationship, is not to suppress, but to liberate. Yeah. Having that self-love, having that, that respect for yourself is, is a huge step and it's something that's not easy to do. So the, my dad always telling me that, always, always making sure that I understood how important it was to love myself is something that is very important to me because it's something that for me, it's something that is very important to me because it's something that for me took a while. So it's something that has been repeated to me constantly throughout my life. And it's something that I treasure because I mean, it, it helps, it helps me, it, yeah, it helps to, helps to, I don't know how else to say it. It makes me pull myself towards myself. Just show me you go, man. Oh, 
When she was a baby, um, black women used to come up to me and say, like, you're not doing her hair right, you're not looking after it properly, because it was, it was all like she was, because uh, you, you were sleeping on your back all the time, so you, it was going a bit bald at the back. Yeah, wow, well, I, I didn't know that. When, <laughs> I, just, I just remember that, them telling me that I had to comb the hair in a certain way yeah. and do things. So that was the start of, start of the hair issue. As Tandy got a bit older, I think we did relax your hair We once. did, we relaxed. You wanted to relax it, so we did that once or twice. And then and I got braids for the wedding. Then you got long braids put in. For the wedding. Yeah, which was like this huge process. It, it made me so cry. so long, made you cry, your hair, head hurt. <laughs> Look gorgeous, and then, and then after that we went to dreadlocks. Yeah. So with the dreadlocks, um, that was a really long. She had those for about four or five years, I think. Longer, even longer. So that was a really long process. And but we you, used to go to the hairdresser, and yeah. she taught me how to do the my um, hair. Yeah. How to, to twist do with my, it to yeah. keep it happening. And then you did that yourself. Yeah, which in that final photo of you was looking pretty messy. It was looking messy, but you <laughs> I did. I didn't but know what you, I was doing, but I was. You learned crying. like along the way, though, yeah. how to do my hair, and yeah. then you would do my hair for me. Yeah. So like, right. So then I'll cut some more mozzarella. Yeah. Well, we got enough for now. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's the end of that. Is that not basil? I think this is wild basil. Dude. Hmm. Right here. Do you wanna? When Tandy was younger, I don't think she perceived any difference between herself and our family, the rest of the people in our family. She was just one of the family members. Uh, obviously, as she got older, she began to come, become more aware of it. I remember in primary school, um, I had some beautiful racial slurs thrown at me, which was quite difficult because then you can't go to your parents and be like, hey, this is what it feels like when someone calls me this, because that's not something that they have to deal with. So that was quite, for me, that was quite painful. And it wasn't, it wasn't a case of them not being sympathetic. It wasn't a case of them not being like, wow, this is not okay. Of course they were like that. They were like, this is discrimination against you. but. It's not something that they would have experienced in their life. It's not something that they will ever have to experience in their life because they're not black. That was a bit of an eye opener for me, especially sort of because I was so used to being in a family where it's like, this is the norm, this is fine, this is how it goes. But then sort of the outside world doesn't know how it works in your family and doesn't, that's not it's something that they're going to be like, oh, okay, so this is how they function. Let's sort of accommodate that. Something that I know that I noticed that my and my mom doesn't notice. So, for example, going shopping, and if if we're at a checkout and I'm taking stuff out of the trolley, often people will ask me if if it's still the same, if it's still the same um, person buying the items coming out of this trolley. Like my mom will be pushing the trolley up to the checkout, and then. I'll be unpacking the trolley and people will be like, is this together? Are you, are you, I know she pushed the trolley, but is this your stuff? Is it not your stuff? And then that's not something that they notice, but it's something that I notice. And I'm like, yes, that's my stuff because that's my mom. But society isn't looking at my mom and I as in like a mother and a daughter. They're sort of like, okay, there's a black girl taking something out of a trolley that a white woman was just pushing. She notices someone in the shop looking at her strangely mm. and you, she you know you can tell that they're thinking what's what's the relationship what's, here mm. and she just loves going hey mom yeah i love doing that <laughs> where are we going next I love, doing like that. That. <laughs> <laughs> I love doing that because people are like because people look at us like this is weird i wonder what it is and i'm like i don't have time for people to be confused so i'll be like but she mom likes, she likes messing with people's minds I do. <laughs> I do that a lot i forgot that i do that i'll be like mom 
what are we eating for dinner? Just like, or something random, no, random. just for the, just for the kids. Hi, it's fun, it's nice, because people are so shocked, they're like, because I mean, they're not going to ask, so you might as well just like, let's clear it up and give you shock value at the same time, because you're already confused. <laughs> And then in university that completely changed because it was so it was so much more open and we're in a totally different space. And there's just um there's there's more diversity. The most obvious the most obvious reconstruction of my identity was my name change, me changing my name. So oh everybody always gets very confused with this, but I was born Rachel Knene. Rachel, wow. That was given to me by my birth mother, so a black woman named me Rachel. So then when I was adopted, my name was then Rachel Tandiwe Walter. Um, and then I changed my name, so now I'm just Tandiwe Walter. And I think that, I don't know, it just, Rachel never fit me. And I think when I was like, okay, I am Tandiwe Ulcha, this is who I am. Then I started, started sort of reevaluating myself in my entirety. So I know it sounds weird. It sounds weird that it took like a name change, but that was sort of like, that was something that was 100% my choice that I'm like, okay, this is something that I'm going to do. And it's something that I feel like I need to do because I feel like this other name isn't me, it isn't part of my identity. I think actually it made me reconstruct my identity. I had to do a sort of a review of who I, who I am because that's, I, I realized that, I mean, for like my high school and primary school, I wasn't really fully, fully myself because that was a part of myself that it wasn't, wasn't that it wasn't acknowledged, it was just not dealt with because it wasn't, it wasn't, I wasn't surrounded by enough people to question. I wasn't surrounded by enough people who look like me to question if, if there was more to me than what I was surrounded by. When you walked into my room, you couldn't see me being black. So what is it that when you walk into my room, what were you looking for to find that in me? You know, what was it that you thought was missing? What was it about my room that didn't make me black enough? What is black enough? What is black? Like, I know that sounds weird. Because black is something, but I don't know what it is. Or maybe I don't know what it is that makes me not black enough for people. Because I don't know what what I am not doing, what I am doing, what I'm supposed to be doing. And I am a black person. I know that I'm a black person. I may not be the type of black person that people are used to seeing, but that's just the fact that people aren't used to seeing people like me. And that's okay, because I'm okay with myself.